Rio de Janeiro, April 7th, 1831. The crowds are celebrating. Emperor Pedro I, deeply unpopular and seen as a foreigner and enemy of freedom, has just abdicated the throne. He's given into both public and official pressure and will leave for Portugal. But to the people, this isn't an abdication. It's a revolution, like a second Independence Day. The crowd expectantly stares at the balcony, waiting to see their new emperor, Pedro II, a boy born in Brazil, one they can raise as a native son while teaching him the principles of constitutional government. A Brazilian emperor for a Brazilian nation. They see a shape emerge. Their new monarch looks down on them, and they cheer. From the ground, however, they don't see that the five-year-old Pedro is too small to look over the balcony railing. And in order to make himself tall enough to be seen, the child emperor is standing on a chair. Thanks so much to Bright Sellers for raising a glass to history and sponsoring this episode. When Pedro I left for Portugal, he left a country in crisis and children who would never see him again. With Brazil torn between political factions, economically drained by wars and revolts, and still bitterly divided on issues like regional autonomy and slavery, Pedro was under no illusion that things would be difficult for his young son once he became king at the age of 18. So, to help with that transition, Pedro asked his old friend, José Bonifacio de Andrada, one of his key allies during independence, to be his child's guardian and private tutor. Though it should be noted that years before, he had actually exiled Andrada over his actions during the Night of Agony, but by 1831, he was back, with Pedro realizing there was no one he trusted more. Brazil's 1824 constitution had made provisions for a regency, and the General Assembly's appointment of three regents initially went smoothly. But it soon became clear that Pedro's abrupt departure and the weak executive power of the regents had allowed all of Brazil's long-term problems to boil over at once. See, Brazil covered a huge amount of territory, which included different ecology, agricultural systems, and histories. Some that previously had Dutch settlements also had differing trade patterns, with heavier economic exchange with Europe and Africa than the other provinces of Brazil. And all those provinces, some of whom, like the northern province Pernambuco, who rebelled regularly, were furious about the centralization of power in Rio when their local needs were rarely addressed. The imperial government, it seemed, was only interested in levying high taxes. Slavery, too, was an unresolved issue. In 1826, Brazil had signed a treaty with the UK banning the importation of slaves. But Brazil still had an enormous population of enslaved Africans. In addition, because any child born from a free father and an enslaved mother was born free, there was also a large and growing population of free people of color, some of whom themselves own slaves. Indeed, by ending the importation of slaves, British and Brazilian abolitionists had hoped to phase slavery out, but that wasn't happening, particularly because slave importers were not abiding by the ban. Oh wow, imagine that! Similarly, while the 1824 Constitution insisted all non-enslaved men were equal and gave citizens the vote regardless of race, Brazil's non-white population still experienced discrimination on a daily basis. Then, of course, there were Brazil's indigenous inhabitants, who, while protected by law from slavery, were still similarly ill-treated and underrepresented in government. So, realizing there was a real danger of the country fracturing, the General Assembly tried to provide better representation with an 1834 constitutional amendment called the Additional Act, establishing local assemblies and giving provinces greater autonomy. It actually made things worse. As local factions tried to dominate the new provincial governments, and the central government lost more authority, leading to more separatist uprisings. Revolts of all shapes and sizes sent the provinces in the north and south into tumult as they tried to declare independence or insist that Pedro II take his throne immediately. Slave uprisings stormed towns and were brutally suppressed by the central government or its newly established National Guard. Free men of color staged civil rights marches where they demanded equality. Attempted revolutions united indigenous leaders, slaves, army officers, and plantation owners in sometimes bizarre alliances with few common causes apart from dissatisfaction with the regency. Portuguese residents were particularly vulnerable and at times were thrown out of towns and murdered by mobs. And in 1835, an uprising among enslaved African Muslims came close to taking an entire city. In fact, there were so many revolts, it's actually difficult time-wise to discuss each of them individually. Heck, in 1839 alone, there were seven major uprisings. Yeah, seven in one year. By 1840, the court and legislature had decided there was only one solution to unite the country and end the reign of anarchy. Pedro II must take the throne. 
Now, constitutionally, he wasn't supposed to be able to do that until his 18th birthday, which was still four years away. But they were worried that the country wouldn't last that long without splitting up. And, you know, funny thing about princes, they don't actually have birth certificates at this point, so... Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Please bail us out, Pedro! Happy birthday to you! And many more. I mean, we joke, but actually not by much. Pedro himself was, ironically, the last person to be told about the plan, and took the throne at the mature age of 15. Now, what exactly was he doing the whole time before that, you might ask? Well, mostly being hidden from the instability. For nine years, this poor kid had lived in lonely isolation, allowed to see no other children except his sister, and made to devote all but two of his waking hours each day to studying. The result was a knowledgeable young man who appreciated art, spoke multiple languages, and knew the Constitution inside and out, but who also hated being emperor. Feelings of resentment that only grew deeper when he entered a respectful but passionless political marriage with a Sicilian princess. Though it does just bear mentioning that while Pedro II did have affairs, unlike his father, he kept them quiet. And just to be clear, this all sounds nuts, right? Thinking that after all of these rebellions and revolts, some of them Republican in nature, Everyone was just going to rally around a teenage king? Come on. Except, and I can't make this up, everyone, it worked. Things calmed down, especially after Pedro had children and started taking a more active hand in government. Stuff just cooled off. And the political parties decided instead of being at each other's throats constantly, they could be a generally ineffectual elite class taking turns in government. Progress? Now, of course, there were still some revolts, but fewer and thus easier to suppress. And in 1850, Brazil truly turned the corner when it decided to finally start abiding by its 1826 agreement to end the importation of slaves. Until then, the government had been complicit in allowing it to continue. And, you know, a funny thing happened. See, importing slaves was one of the largest industries in Brazil. But because it was off the books, it couldn't be taxed. So suddenly, everyone pulled their money out of illegal slave transportation and put it into legitimate businesses, especially in expanding plantations to feed Europe and North America's enormous appetite for coffee. Brazil's financial problems disappeared practically overnight. The government had tons of money to lay roads to link the country, erect new public buildings, and finally pave the streets of the cities. And Rio became an urban center on the Paris model, with theaters and art galleries and a rambunctious urban culture of fashion and civic life. Pedro also launched a major cultural renaissance, hoping to link his diverse and widely distributed population by creating a sense of nationalist unity. He commissioned paintings, poems, operas, and novels depicting the great events of Brazilian history and the country's unique geography and ecology. He founded a symphony, and most of all, sponsored historians to write the definitive story of how Brazil came to be. Now, of course, this was a fiction. An imagined past meant to link Brazilians and emphasizing the idea of a European-style constitutional monarchy in the tropics. Many of these plays, novels, poems, and paintings celebrated the noble Indian as a symbol of this new nation, despite the fact that the indigenous people had no representation in government and were, even then, being brutalized and marginalized. Now, it probably won't surprise you to also learn that these treatments of Brazilian history rarely, if ever, mention slavery in a country that, we should remember, was mostly black and mixed race. A fact that was becoming ever more uncomfortable to Brazil's elite, to the point that the government brought in European immigrants in hopes of whitening it. Yet as the United States finally abolished its own slave system following the Civil War, the writing was on the wall for Brazil. They, along with Cuba, were now the only slave states in the Americas. It was an issue that would need to be reckoned with soon. But there was also another major crisis on the horizon. As Pedro reached the height of his power, and Brazil started to look at laying rail lines and telegraph wires across its vast distances, war threatened on its southern border. A Paraguayan war that would suck Brazil in and change everything for the empire. Oh man, Zoe, I can't wait to see how this series concludes next week. Hey, you think it would be fun to get the team together to watch the finale? <coughs> All right, I'll clean the apartment, you brush up on 1800 South American fun facts, and... <coughs> oh, sweet! Drinks are taken care of thanks to our friends at Bright Cellars. Now, there are two things you should know about me when it comes to wine. One, I love having it on hand for guests. And two, you could fill a swimming pool with everything I don't know about wine. But thanks to Bright Cellars, a monthly wine club that's made my process of wine selection a breeze, I'm not just picking wine based off the labels anymore. 
Not only do they source their wines from small vineyards from all over the world, but they also provide a super fun seven question quiz each month that gathers your taste preferences to deliver wines you're guaranteed to love. For instance, when they gave me the question about what my favorite juice is, I got to select the hilarious but accurate answer, is coffee juice. Spoiler alert, it is. Then in a few days, my custom curated box of wine shows up at my door. My favorite this month being the Post Haste, a crisp and refreshing 60% Sommelian and 40% Sauvignon Blanc from France that's 100% tasty as heck. Whereas Jeff just told me he and his wife really dug the Obscura Petite Syrah, a full-bodied and richly flavored California red with notes of blackberry jam and ripe plum that pairs well with roast spiced pork loin. Oh, look at you, fancy pants. Someone's been studying their wine wisdom cards. See, with each bottle in your box, they also send along a card that outlines the tasting notes, suggested pairings, best serving temperatures, and origin. Basically, it's a neat little mini class filled with info so you can feel like a sommelier and impress your friends. Actually, speaking of friends, you can even gift one or more boxes from Bright Sellers of personalized wine, which funnily enough, while writing this ad read, Jeff and I discovered we both independently did over the holidays. So, I don't know, great minds think alike, I guess. Wink. So assuming you're of the appropriate drinking age in your neck of the woods, how would you like to get all that goodness delivered right to your door and a great deal to boot? Right now, you can get your first six bottles from Bright Sellers for 50% off by using our link in the description below. That's six bottles for just $45, meaning it's less than $8 a bottle for wine curated to your personal palate. Not to mention when you sign up, not only will your taste buds be tantalized, but you'll also be supporting our channel in the process. Cheers to your support. The biggest EC thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angela Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Orioles One for being fantastic legendary patrons. 